Um, yeah, I've been <coughs> kind of, uh, I guess, just a quick introduction to my work, uh, to people who maybe don't know, is um, I mainly just work with image material uh, that I find kind of online as material to make art. I like kind of treat it the way you know, a sculptor, traditional sculptor treat clay or something like this, kind of um, coming across material debris, visual debris online and trying to make sense of it and look into it and then make work out of it. So whenever I talk about art, I always just incorporate this material into um, my um, into my conversation, although I haven't made this particular kind of images. And uh, um, in a more deeper sense, I'm interested in the ecologies that are surrounding image production, especially um, kind of these days in uh, kind of the never-ending, like uber-expanding image production uh, of uh, digital images from all sort of sides and uh, origins, um, and uh, kind of on a let's say kind of planetary scale, sort of uh, on a level that affects the actual uh, planet that we live on and every human being that lives on it, um, therefore. Um, and therefore, and that's why I chose to sort of start with this production, which is just a website I found online where they have like a real-time visualizations of um, different chemical flows or different flows that are happening on the planet. And this particular video I showed it as part of this particular view I showed as part of my um, a Venice Pavilion just in the space. Uh, and I think so as I understand it, this is a visualization of a flow of CO2 uh, gas on the planet now. This gas, uh, this is like kind of a free source, you just find it any you can just go to this link that's sort of there. Um, but when I found it, I was just so kind of excited that it's it's supposedly real time. It's basically translating um, sensor information into numerical code into visualizing like visualizing these uh, flows, um, and uh, it has like different projections, different angles on the Earth, which I always find very important. Um, because we're sort of used to just seeing one projection of the globe more like this. But there's also different ways to project the globe and different... And I really love this one. Um, and, and this is like, I think, the step one for everyone right now. And this is like the core of kind of um, what um, my interest is to kind of really look at the world differently. Um, and one of the main, one of the starting points is to like just look at it from a different, um, not like Europe in the center, blah 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 blah. Anyway, and they have like beautiful stuff here. So they have like ocean waves, like this. Anyway, so but when uh, the other thing that I'm interested in in relation to it is like how how the flows are visualized. And it's sort of this, um, you know, this kind of vectoral uh, dynamic kind of flow of lines, and sort of it's like a real-time drawing that is based on numerical data, um, and obviously it has aesthetic value to it, um, and uh, it's kind of uh, this is like the macro perspective that. Um, I always have in mind um, that I think is key to everything. I don't know. So, but, um, um, then we go to the other side, which is kind of the beginning of it all, in the sense of the beginning of images, the begin beginning of vision, and this is supposedly like the first, the most. Kind of this is contemporary creature, but this is how maybe 
the first eye looked like, the first creature with an eye looked like, and it's just called an eye spot. It's basically, again, like almost like a binary eye. It either sees light or it doesn't see light. And there's a binary uh, nature to it. Um, and the light, it, and it's basically probably like one protein that either registers um, sunlight or it doesn't. And, um, and everything else kind of came from that. Um, and uh, uh, somehow, you know, our vision came from that, and the, Im the image production kind of uh, is based on this architecture. And I'm interested also in thinking kind of in this systemic sense that whatever we are seeing now, whatever um, the camera is uh, capturing now, is related to um, to these you know ancient structures that have been developing for a long time by themselves. And then we are like, um, you know, further on, we are um, sort of, we are at the point of understanding how our own eyes work, how these guys' eyes work, and how to make eyes with the cameras, um, and um, and possibly how to uh, not just make an eye, but then also how to generate vision as. Uh, vision from capturing light to, to interpretation of that light or interpretation of um, reality. And um, so this is a, just a still from Blade Runner, the first Blade Runner. But this was, uh, it's like a very pure way to to access a lot of these topics. And I'm not a um, um, film scientist, but uh, the combination of like, uh, sort of biomimicry technology and human agency and a, a sort of synthetic agency here is very interesting and I just like to use this image. Um, and um, uh, below is actually the, the real life um, sort of hero of mine, which is um, this uh, lab warm lab organism called the C. elegans. And um, C. elegans is like a non... Uh, it's basically used widely in all the lab research everywhere in the world. There are billions of these creatures alive every moment, and they die. And you know, their life cycle is really short, like eight hours, or no, maybe a bit longer. But their production cycle is eight hours. Um, and these guys are—they um, are—they are an animal, so they're not a parasite, and they're not. Um, they're a multicellular animal and they're our relative, they're our distant relative, and that's one of the reasons they're used in the research, is because they are sort of, we have like a direct connection to them. They're also very simple, so they are the first animal, and they, they, they only have like 700 cells in their body, and they're the first animal who was genetically, um, their genome was fully mapped, and they're the first animal whose uh, system of neurons, so their brain and their neural system was fully mapped. And they're also the first animal who was sort of was, became like a ghost in the shell type of animal because there is a project called Open Worm, which is a simulation project for these animals where they're trying to basically code their life, um, uh, their life kind of behavior, their life form into code, so then it sort of, it becomes like artificial life, like digital artificial life. Um, and uh, in this particular image, um, and they, because they're so widespread uh, lab animals, they are, there's like, uh, you know, millions of images taken off them. So they're sort of this uh, kind of unknown celebrity in the science world in the sense that they are just being captured. There's more pictures of these guys than of any human celebrity or even maybe of like us, all of us combined just because a lot of these images are automated. There's just hundreds of hours of footage of their uh, life cycles, videos and all that that is then processed by computers mostly or um, but um, another thing that is, makes it more synthetic and like, next level is that, of course, they're being constantly genetically modified by, um, by people. And, for example, one of the ways to uh, look into sort of the research, you know, whatever, usually they're used for developmental research, so like the research into how an egg becomes an adult organism. And, uh, um, in order to like, look into what's going on in their bodies, 
They sometimes add this protein, which is fluorescent, in their in their gen in the code genetic code sort of of the egg. And then once the once the organism is adult, you see like the fluorescent sort of uh, patches that express themselves, and in a way um, that's almost like kind of um, they almost be and then they sort of their body show the kind of their body this fluorescent light answers whatever question we were asking it in a way so it's almost like a living map or a living kind of a scientific visualization of it, its own sort of or of human interest in the animal in the first place and so this protein almost becomes like an ink and the, the, the expression becomes sort of the, the animal itself is a, is an alive creature it's a mutant it's a, it's a, it's sort of a labor. It's a scientific labor. It's a, it's a side work in a way. It's a, it's sort of an icon, and and um, and it kind of captures a lot of. And obviously, it's like a soldier for the biotech industry, and ultimately, like the medicine relies on it, and all kinds of stuff. And I'm interested in the fact that kind of how the, how you know the. And this is just one example, but the production, the kind of relationship between um, altering matter and, and like uh, changing living creatures and beings and ecosystems and image production and how it's sort of intertwined in a very um, deep and dark sense. And it is, so there's kind of, it's not a like, kind of visualization and idea of an image is not a superficial to kind of reality is sort of intertwined especially in this sort of contemporary technologies that relate to ecology and uh, kind of life itself and vision um, and I just kind of go on and make art out of these things <laughs> um, and as a, as a gesture of like presenting it to the world so if I if I admire the sea elegance, I want it to be visible beyond its little this little image that you find in some scientific article. I just want it to be kind of more spread a little bit in a different way. Uh, and also this goes to fruit flies, which is like another another um, main animal for research. And it's the same story with fruit flies as with the sea elegance that they are kind of the main mutant side work. Uh, creatures and there's like thousands thousands of images of them um, and um, kind of the cutout element of it like kind of taking these things out of context <coughs> first I did it intuitively and now more and more kind of related to um, to the to the sort of industries themselves and I'm going to explain further how but one of in more kind of art historical sense it's, it's just about taking something insignificant and um, blowing it up and giving it significance and giving it space and giving it attention. And this flow and this sort of switch of attention is also how I'm integrated into that. This is what my role is. I'm just like kind of doing that. And then hopefully people like it so then I get some you know, as well. <laughs> um, and so this is like, uh, this is a scientific kind of diagram I found, but it's, it's more like an illustration. And so this is like the fruit flies and the sea elegant worms, they're like the coolest thing in <laughs> for science in terms of... Re and and I'm, I don't even want to say science because it sounds, sounds like a little bit benign. It's like the whole industry is about biotechnology, medical science, uh, all that stuff. And, um, and there's like a weird diagram I found where it's like a gradient transition from the fruit fly to the worm, although there's no, and the human is in between. And there's no relationship except that we're all relatives, like they are our relatives and we are their relatives. But what I find, what I like is the forms in between, you know, there's like the, the from the center to the left, there's this row with all these half human, half fly monsters. And this is like kind of a pure, this is where horror lives, you know, this is the cultural that domain of horror and the Cronenberg and all that stuff, and aliens. And, um, and I was like, okay, this is, this is kind of, this, this is the area I actually want to explore and I've been exploring. So it's a, for me it became a diagram for my work as well. 
And I'm not the only one exploring it. As I said, it's a cultural thing that everybody has been exploring. It's a Frankenstein area. It is uh, all those areas. And it's just every generation with new technologies is being updated. Um, and so this is an image of um, my, uh, like one of the rooms I did in Venice, where I'm basically building these in-between creatures that are uh, simultaneously you know, alive and machinic and mutated and scary and uh, kind of um, benign and uh, all that. And, and th these sculptures are made out of electronic baby swings, which is a very weird object, but it's, it's, it's moving, so I don't have a really good video, but it's kind of moving. And if you go to, um, and maybe I'll show you later the actual movement, um, and the other thing is, for example, um, like this, um, this relationship to light and to what is being projected or visualized is, is sort of part of that. Um, and uh, this is a more like a, another illustration that I was doing in my research where on the right side is a part of the sculpture that I'm building and I was projecting a lamp on it so you see like kind of a, a spine and you see this transparent nastiness. Uh, and on the, on the left side is the test ground for a Mars rover that they have in the uh, Sp European Space Agency in Netherlands. And they build these massive, basically, art installations in a way of like Mars ground. And they have these robots drive around and they have, and they're testing actually the vision and the navigation and how they sort of, the, basically the AI of the thing. But it also looks kind of like a simple insect. And so these relationships are kind of, they tickle me, so I keep making work that is trying to access it. Um, and uh, it's just another image, and like, I just have a projection of a lot of these research images within this space as well, because I want it to be all like kind of looping on itself. Um, this is just a little close up of one of the sculptures. I have this weird silicon fish baits on it and then um, with pipes and it's sort of like a um, B-movie prom style uh, production like kind of not very fancy but anything that sort of convincingly looks convincingly uh, in between like in, in this uncanny horror level is interesting there's another one they had this weird laser laser eyes it's another one uh, so it's just the latest work. Um, and it's close, it has like four mom's logo because it's just the logo of the company that makes these baby swings. And this idea obviously of nurturing and like incubation is related to horror as well. A lot of the, in like the alien movies or whatever, the incubation is uh, kind of part, is like the most horrific part of the cycle, for example. So. Taking like a baby swing was sort of a conscious choice in that sense, uh, but also it's like the cheapest robot looking thing you can use, you know, because I didn't want to like go to like a serious robot company and spend like tons of money or effort in getting a real robot, I just wanted the quickest thing. So this is another part of it. Uh, and then one of the example projections was uh, part of the research is like I'm trying to um, I'm, I'm really interested in people whose like main job and career is like image processing or processing of visual data and who these people are and what they're doing and what is this new even type of job. And so this is one of the, uh, this is like a new, uh, uh, I think Osiris Rex is like a camera on a mission or on a, one of the probe missions so this girl is like responsible for what this camera captures and the processing of data and that's like a common job and it's very um it's a it's like a common job these days and it's, it's sort of in itself this idea that your whole thing is about um processing some sort of data from some sort of place that we have no direct access to is very interesting to me and the other part of it is kind of um archaeological uh, angle, which is um, kind of uh, even in the most you know biotechnological contemporary sense, like the genes that we're often looking at, there's some sort of ancient material, and it's kind of like 
planet archaeology almost, and it's never just about the future or just about this mysterious, uh, you know, um, kind of techno optimistic storyline. It's, it's always looping on the past and kind of the dysfunctions and previous experience and and kind of the archae I, I just call it kind of archaeological angle. And the other um, angle is, uh, which is kind of the core one, which is uh, non-human vision or machine vision. And this is like, on the left side, there is a, it's an example of how just a car camera, that kind of AI machine vision in a car uh, would identify a, a deer crossing the street. Just these weird squares and then movement and that's it. And it's sort of, this is uh, like the car uh, kind of cameras on this level now. Um, um, I'm just going to jump into this quickly. This is another example of the genetic stuff where like this, uh, actually the person who took the first, first photograph of the DNA was this woman, Rosalind, and she was also part of the Nobel Prize winning team who, did, who discovered the helix, the double helix. But she, this is the first image of like DNA in a way, and it's, it's sort of, it's again like understanding the structure of something and taking an image of it is often like coinciding in this weird way. Um, and this is uh, still from Venice again, where I have this projection with the CO2 in the background, and I have this weird kind of resin sculptures hanging from the ceiling with some phrases of found uh, uh, text that I kind of uh, come across online from different articles. It's not kind of poetic text, it's often uh, something scientific, but then I mix it up a little bit. And it's it's a fold of a brain and uh, kind of this understanding that um, our consciousness is the same way as our brain folded, is kind of a territory and um, the types of sort of um, visual, uh, visual uh, signals that we are bombarded with is a form of um, kind of colonization or it's a form of um, basically it's a uh, it's a territory to fight for, and a lot of people are fighting for this territory, and it's just one thing. Uh, this is just like a formal comparison of an image is uh, taken from a moon uh, with some, the red color is kind of a specific mineral, and the images that are taken as for like brain activity. Um, when a person is listening to music, <laughs> for example. And this brain projection was, uh, this brain image was a projection in the show as well. And this is a micro CT scan of her, um, of her opossum fetus um, in in the body still, I think, or they aborted it, I guess, and took a it took a full scan. And again, this kind of goes, you know, planetary scale, but it goes also goes into the bones, and it, we just use different scanners and different cameras and different different light waves to penetrate objects and to basically map everything we can. And this idea of this like crazy mapping is um, sort of getting out of control because it's easier and easier to do. Uh, I don't know if I should show a video of this. Maybe I'll just quickly show because it was also in the, in the exhibition I used it. This is like just some. Um, this is how it looks like this whole scanning situation. Um, and again, it's sort of. Um, this is you see how it goes through the scanner, and this is what you're seeing. Again, it's just light. It's just kind of grayscale of. Um, of pixels, but it's uh, at the same time it's this you know complete see-through of a creature, and there's probably hours and hours of this kind of stuff ever on some server somewhere, and um, and it's just kind of this you know kind of obsessive um, documentation of life through and through. Yeah, and then this is um, a villain again. 
and in the middle I had this totem, which was also basically a, a, a similar technique used for scanning a baby mouse. And this was like a three meter high, three and a half meter high kind of totem uh, of a scan of a baby mouse. This is the back of it. And in the pavilion I kind of um, tried to uh, like a little bit amplify the kind of the horror element of it. Um, and this is to go further into computer um, kind of machine vision. This is a uh, this is a this is a spread from this catalog I did last year for um, exhibition I had in uh, Hamburg. Um, but on on the left side it's a galaxy, and on the right side it's a cell. And this sort of this uh, kind of this weird formal similarity of analysis is um, interesting. This is a to kind of some algorithms are going for machine vision are going beyond just kind of identifying an object or a box, uh, box it in, and uh, there's this uh, algorithm called blob segmentation, which is used for actually doing the silhouette, the outline of an object in the image uh, during the analysis, during the basically image processing. Um, and, um, and I was like, okay, this looks like me when I'm doing my cutout. And, um, and there's, a sort of, there's some sort of principle behind it, which is like, I need to outline objects from the background, I need to isolate something which I'm looking for. And this is exactly what this algorithm is used for. And on the left side, on the right side, there's like a part of the visualization uh, for how the algorithm operates. And I'm also just, I was just in some lecture I found online, but it's like, some, it just looks mysterious to me. <laughs> I don't understand at all how this algorithm works, but um, I kind of I'm sort of surfing through the, this knowledge myself. And this is the same uh, applied to the little worms that we had before, where they're just being s scanned in um, and researched, and their outline is being kind of uh, um, uh, like they're catching the outline and also the trajectory of movement of the animal. And this is another example for like an explosion. Um, this being outlined as a, as a uh, as an image like in the image by the by the algorithm. Um, and the same with uh, like birds, for example. Um, and I'm just interested. I'm, I'm I find this sort of shapes shape selection this idea of what is like a what is a drawing and what is what makes like an outline, what makes a form, what it makes a shape that we recognize you know, as people related to this machine recognition. And there's obviously like a weird um, in-between zone where some, you know, we're trying to make them see like us maybe. And, uh, and it's sort of slowly going towards there in a clumsy way. <coughs> Um, this is how they visualize kind of the human vision. Uh, we're not the algorithm. We sort of get the eye goes, you know, the nerve goes into the brain, and then the back side of the brain supposedly analyzes the visual material. Um, and um, on the um, there's like a whole. This is I don't know if anyone understands what's on the screen, but basically. Um, there's this whole um, world of um, uh, images that are being made for science that computers cannot process, but they're too complicated for um, they're too complicated for computer algorithm like I was showing you. But they're also um, necessary to read, and so there's this like citizen science initiatives where. They are dumping like one million images online, and they ask people to to look through the images and do their manually like outlines for, for example, cells. And there's it's a voluntary citizen science thing, and um, and thousands of people do that as a form of therapy, for example. Um, and uh, and I just I'll just do one quickly now to show you what's the point. So you get this image, and it's just like some sort of biological cell material. And you don't know what it is, and, and you're bored at work, so you are asked to basically draw like a little outline of of a, of a cell order. 
And if, if like thousands and thousands of people do that, then they get statistically correct results. And, um, and then you said done. Mm -hmm. And you push next. <laughs> and, and the point is, it's sort of this like, like human computers that they had in the early 20th century where women were like, typing stuff or the, the human like, computer calculators who did uh, calculations for NASA, like in hidden figures, for example, maybe you saw. Um, this is the same stuff, but it's sort of a massive scale that is being done now. And, um, and it's like from fields, uh, from all kinds of fields. Um, so this was like cell biology, and then there's this brain matching one, where you um, you have to scan, you have to compare two different um, start project. So you basically they give you these two images, and you have to um, you have to like find spot the differences and just mark them. And there's like brains of thousands of images. You don't know who these people are. You don't know what's going on. You just ask to do this one thing, and it's based on your visual recognition of forms. And computers cannot do it; it's too complicated still. So they, a lot of like um, scientific initiatives are now about like including people and their vision into it. And um, and there's somehow it's brains. It's also um, like animal faces, um, galaxies all kinds of stuff and uh, again I was like hey this is the kind of nerd territory that again matches with my own instinct of like finding an, finding a kind of a pattern and then making an outline of it and then like, turning it into the world uh, right. why doesn't it start with the right image um, so that's like Kind of coincidence. Um, and the other, um, the other s stuff that you can find on this Zooniverse website is like all this uh, trap camera footage of animals all over the world, and again thousands and thousands of images of um, of um, wild animals in, na in nature parks that are being captured by trap cameras. Tra uh, there's sort of infrared night vision ones, so the animal is not really aware that it is a camera. And they just use them for, again, research and conservation. But there's so many images that they're kind of beyond. And these ones are impossible to process with a computer. Um, and um, what I find is kind of like this, again, continuous surveillance of everything that you, we can survey beyond not just human beings, but also Okay, we want to know every single leopard that lives in this uh, national park. We want to we want to just map as much as possible, and in this kind of uh, freakish way. And at the same time, it's it is useful for conservation, but it's just sort of the expanse of mapping is is quite um, monumental in a way. So this is like the room I did in Venice again, where I took the leopard and. Um, and uh, we reintroduced him to the world in a different way, for her. Uh, and there was this projection of the fetus. And this is another one where it, it's a it's a lioness um, munching on a on an elephant, and that's just again captured. And it was like this exact moment when this was taken. I find it just kind of bizarre how precise these things are. And I did a sculpture, and this was the first room you see in the Venice Pavilion. And I, I just, again, kind of want to redirect this, to re redirect attention to maybe a, a few people seeing this thing, things automatically in this kind of uh, database mode, and then actually people really looking at it. And this difference between you know, processing image and actually really looking at it. And the difference of context. Um, these guys are... Um, it's like an infrared camera of some chimps. I made a sculpture with them. I want to show you. Uh, this is another spread from the book where I connect this vision to other things, which is um, on the right side, there's images taken by a rover on Mars that are being then kind of conspiracy theory style process. Pro like, there's a different types of processing besides this just 
or I'm going to look at a shape and recognize it. There's also this thing where I'm going to look at something and like recognize aliens, you know, and then this is like a typically human thing to do. Just, like look at the thing and then and be like, okay, there's a conspiracy, there's aliens, and somebody is like, somebody is doing something behind my back. <laughs> Um, and then there's Pokemon Go, which was also, somebody did a Mars thing on it. Um, and this is another type of conspiracy Mars thing, which is really bizarre, but again, it's, sort of, it's part of our vision, interpretations, and cultural mechanism to see these things, and some people just go full on into that. Um, <laughs> There's a website that is literally called like UFO Sighting Daily, which is a contemporary or daily, but for UFO sightings. But all they do is just take like NASA images and do this stuff. And again, this like idea of pointing something and kind of making it a visualization or um, a, like focusing attention with the arrows and the lines and the outlines. I, I find it a very specific instinct. Um, and this is another example of again of a visual, uh, visual processing algorithm, and you see here it flows of kind of uh, attention again, but it's called optical flow, or like it's somehow the algorithm is trying to analyze the image for kind of flow of whatever is happening within the image. And I fully don't understand what's exactly going on, but it's a similar, it's a bit similar to this in my in my opinion. And it also reminds me a lot of this early, of the ancient art, which is this uh, Nakada uh, pottery from uh, pre-Pharaonic Egypt, it's like five, six thousand years BC. And I, I love these um, they're super simple uh, drawings always, but there's a lot of lines and there's a lot of pointing and there's a lot of this capturing of flows of things just with like, these simple lines. Um, and also the same in uh, in the early Neolithic um, uh, kind of housing in uh, Turkey, and these sort of the birds with the and um, the, the the birds, the flight, the flow, the lines, the arrows. It's all. I mean, this arrow I added, but uh, the uh, the birds are totally real. Like this is how it was. Um, and I just did my own interpretation of it. I just did this for this one show. I did this sort of little pottery, uh, like poorly, poorly made um, Mars conspiracy pottery. <laughs> um, and also I did um, these uh, these like pointer arrows or like uh, flow arrows that are related to economics. But for me, there's just this. There's a clear relation between the economics. This sort of this style of visualization, but also the optical flow of the algorithms and the Nakada and kind of this drawing drawing mode um, and this, this kind of fossilized um, contemporary economic arrows. There's another example of this optical flow stuff for some landscape of the cloud. It's poor quality that you just see tons of little red arrows. And it's sort of a convention, a convention that is rooted in like deep in thousands and thousands of years of human culture. And this is a pavilion in Venice again, where I had like a sculpture, kind of fire sculpture made of these arrows, and then there's a there's a polar bear that just who just ate some um, some dolphin. Um, so he has this red face and some stuff. Um, and um, this is like a the alpha arrow sculpture that I did, which is um, basically kind of, it's very physical and very massive and it's very snake-like. And the snake-likeness is again something that is also, it's, the, I think the arrow design originates in snakes and like shooting arrows. And there's something in between a snake and a shooting arrow. And the snake uh, is also kind of the a classical, um, you know, it's, it's something people have been scared of. It's a horror uh, trope, almost. Snake-like creatures. So I have some... And the snake-like creature, again, it crosses the actual reptiles and the worms that have been... Uh, the, the, the worms that we've been discussing before, the cyborg one, the lab worms. Um, so this is just more shots from the pavilion. Um, some more shots. 
Um, and in addition to the worms, I had the room with like the, the fruit flies on the on the little molecular structures, like which look like fruits. Um, and then these guys. These are just sort of the views. Um, sort of alien, um, again, movie alien type of situation. These eggs are actual images of the embryo development of the worm. So they have like a lot of, you usually capture almost in video actually, or like every every hour they take a photograph of the egg and then you see more and more cell division and then like the worm is born. Um, so I just used, instead of like, it's one egg, but I used the different stages as different eggs. I had this one in the bathroom, guys. And uh, actually, that's it. Or, oh yeah, and then I show you. Um, we made this um, 360 panoramas of the pavilion. And then it's more maybe fun to look at in the pictures. Um, and it's sort of, we made this website with Pavilion, so if anybody's interested in seeing it. Um, there was just a lot of stuff going on, so I wanted to capture everything. And the point of view is like this little platform here, which is kind of what they do when they do panoramas for uh, Mars rovers, because if the Mars rover is taking a picture of Mars and they often take the 360 degrees pictures. If you look down, you see the body of the rover. So for the body here, we didn't want to, to see like a tripod or a human being. We wanted it to be like an ambiguous form that is basically the viewing uh, point of the thing. Um, kind of bubble. Who did that? Um, I'm going to say I made a catalog, which I didn't bring it unfortunately here, but um, it's basically where a lot of this research is captured in text. It's published, published with Sterling Press. We have some really good writers, um, Nora Khan and uh, Tokyo Lutenberg and Wiener Stauff from the international ones, and Jan Thomberg and Kati Illis from the Estonian ones to write some text. But um, it's kind of the latest book I did, and a, lo a lot of kind of this visual research is there. Um, because I'm sort of, I need to capture it, I need to do this research in order to like understand myself what I'm doing. Um, so I, it's kind of it's kind of helpful to just every couple of years make a publication. Um, so all these like, guys are there, and this is the <laughs> this is the the thing that it ate. Um, Maybe that's it. And then maybe I just leave a video of um, how they do research not on Mars but on the deep under the deep sea. And they have these laser pointers. What's that about? Awesome. I don't know. Anyway, so um, this is what they do when they uh, this is a, they found an actual fall uh, whale uh, skeleton and. The whales are so like massive that it takes 30 years for them to like, be like decomposed. So when they're on the on the ocean floor, they become like little cities of for bacteria and special organisms. But for me, like um, this whole is also a process of capturing them with like the deep sea rovers and the, the like the flashlights that they have and the, the laser pointers that they use. This was this is another kind of big domain that I'm super interested in and I did a couple of shows, maybe the one that Thomas Thiel was showing the other time, which is inspired by this whole topic. And, um, and mostly like uh, my work is just looking at these things and feeling excited and then I go like, okay, I should do something with this. Um, but it's also kind of relates to a lot of 
the more they map the ocean floor, the more chance that there will be like people who want to go and mine it and all that stuff. So this 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 is why I like to use the word colonization, like even if it relates to mapping, like mapping and basically visualizing any frontier, if it, if it's inside your genes or if it's um, inside, if it's on the deep sea or if it's another planet, is a form of like colonization because it opens up industrial applications for life and things that are exist, the resources, and and it's always a you know it's always a point of politics then because you know once you map something there will be somebody who will fight for the resource that you mapped, and uh, and I don't like fully uh, spell it out, but I, I always think about it when I make uh, anything. So like mapping as a kind of resource frontier exploration, which which is a colonial principle in itself. Like the, the leopard is not mapping anything, it's just eating and we just have to capture the leopard eating. That's it. Thank you. but it will be more and more embedded into installations. So they will not be standalone videos, they will be like again, using kind of moving image as a form of projection. And, uh, and the third thing is that now more and more, this, as in this, uh, this room, because I have light and moving sculptures, the, the video is just the shadows of the sculptures themselves and it's like the most primitive cinema is you have uh, you have a sort of an object uh, that is a little bit transparent with some trace of image on it and you have light that goes through it and you have a kind of a projection and I think uh, this is the direction I'm going I'm going to use more and more dynamic sculptures with light projection through it which it will create a kind of deep, like primitive like base uh, step one video effects but I don't if I will ever get a chance to really like work with the good uh, video collaborator, I might do like a video video, but myself I just don't have like the right skill set and um, character to pull it through. Yeah. Thank you. I want to know about your relationship to the floor in that installation. I mean, I'm not one of these people who are going to an exhibition and say, oh, well, wow, what a wonderful space, but that, that floor is pretty incredible. Was it something that you put there? Is that how that is? Or does it work so well? Yeah. yeah, the floor is actually, like, it's the exhibition space was like a palazzo in Venice, so huh. it's just an apartment, and the floor is fake marble. It's not the real one. It's great. <laughs> but it's, it's, it works really well, and... Uh, really well, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, and, and it's just like the point here was to make a nest type of mood, so it, that's so what. This is kind of like running the uh, obstructive geology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Three months, three months, three months, three months, three months, three months. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's amazing. But the funny part was that, with it was that they were like, don't even put tape on it because it's like fake marrow. <laughs> it's, like, it's actually like it goes back very really fast. So, um, yeah, so in this case, it's it's usually it's great if something like this happens, but ideally, I would love to do a show like this or something that I I actually like want to contact <coughs> this NASA or like this European Space Agency and like whenever you don't want to use this space, can I have a show there? You know, so, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure they use it all the time because this rover that they're testing is still on Earth; they didn't fly it, so. I <coughs> Um, but this is also like pure sort of, it's like the simulation of geography, you know, basically. Um, and, uh, um, yeah. Can I ask something? So I, I observed that you have like a lot of, uh, most, like mo most of your uh, material or the sources are all of, of, of scientific. It's all like basically scientific uh, data or, uh, so uh, why? Why is there something like, you know, it, it seems to be like a synthesis of all the scientific observation yeah. and data and the way of looking at things. <laughs> well, because it's like a, it's sort of, because of what they're doing is so uh, kind of um, specific, like this warm image, for example, is it's sort of a frontier of, first of all, like how to use um, images because you make these databases of life cycles of creatures and also you um, you use them to make statistical kind of um, maps of um, you know whatever is going on in the body of this animal and so if we think about the history of visual arts or images of pictures or drawings this is like an industrial approach to, um, to pictures uh, which is like a weird frontier and it's it's interesting for me that how it is not really related to domain of uh, painting or uh, drawing or uh, kind of the human stuff in a way, in, in some sense. Um, and, uh, and that is interesting and sort of, uh, it's so far out there, you know, that's why, that's why I have to know about it. Um, it's less so, for example, with images from Mars because they actually plan to stage the views the way that people would like it. So there's like kind of a, like the PR departments of the Mars rover missions, they're like, we want something that looks like Wild Wild West, you know, because people will respond to it. Or we want, to look so we want something that looks cinematic. And in this case, it's in this like purely like lab images, there's no aesthetic imperatives. There's no aesthetic reason for fluorescence, it's just functional. And I find, and then, but in the end, like new visual languages emerge. So I'm just curious about these new visual languages. Um, and then I want to digest it into the domain of images and history of image and like art, you know, in a longer sense. And that's it, you know. Have you cooperated with some scientists? Is Sorry? Your, uh, have you cooperated with some scientists with, with in your artwork? Um, no, because I'm, again, socially, preferably working alone. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that would include me getting out of the house and talking to people. Um, uh, that, but also, like, I like this idea that all of this is just online. Like, I don't need any special badge, any special access code. It's all there. Like, this database is on this universe website. Like, it's all there and it's free, you know. And that's this weird thing. Like, it's, otherwise I'm just embedded in the scientific system. I'm, just, I'm not embedded in them at all, I'm just Googling. Yes, I'm wondering about the kind of presentation you use for the pictures, like it's kind of uh, props or like displays for advertising. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder if, if there is a connection to advertising in general or to um, maybe um, a mainstream culture of pictures. Like, I mean, you use very different pictures. Like, it's, it's not 
definitely not for advertisement, but internet because uh, you mentioned that you were already when you yeah <laughs> but I mean I um, um, like what it means now is not what it meant for me in the beginning. So uh, I don't know what it means for you or what it means in general, but for me it just uh, was like um, <coughs> we were already doing all these things, like me and a bunch of uh, people everywhere, and um, and then I once you know I. And there was this guy, this writer, Jean McHugh, that he got an award for writing, so he had a residency, and he was just, he made a WordPress blog when it was still, people were using WordPress blogs. And he um, just started to write every, post every few days articles about young art that deals with, um, not even articles, just like blog posts about art of people that he knew around that use, um, internet or images from online or, stru or like structures online, services online to make art. And actually Martin Kohout was uh, the Czech artist, he was one of the early people who was in that and he's mentioned in this blog several times. And so this writer Gene, he just called the blog post internet. And, um, and that was the time when I was, and then that was like, that's how I first heard about it, and that was like 2009. And I was working on my graduation project in uh, Sandberg Institute for a graphic design department, but I already knew I wanted to make a book. And I wanted to make like a, and then because I was reading a lot of this blog and I was trying to make my own art and I was friends with all these other artists, I, I uh, was like, this is the thing that I want to, this is the kind of this community and this writing and this, this discussion is that what I want to uh, make my graduation project about, and um, and so and then I thought, what is my own personal interest in this subject? And for example, Martin back then was doing these YouTube performances where he would record himself watching other people's videos for hours and hours and hours, which is like it was crazy, but it was cool. And uh, so there was like text about that um, in this blog and. Um, and I was like, okay, I'm not, I'm not into that. I'm not into like maybe, um, you know, the, the other people were doing these 3D paintings, and they had like tumblers where they were posting these 3D paintings, like paintings done with 3D software, it's like ZBrush. I was like, I'm not. That's not my thing as well. And then there was this, um, there's this whole like network of tumblers where uh, people like Harry Upman and Ari Ins, and it was this big network, and some people from UK. They were doing this uh, Tumblr, like super beautiful um, kind of image aggregations of basically like kind of I don't know how to it, <laughs> but um, basically like Earth and technology, 21st century. <laughs> and then I was like, that's I'm more into that. And then I was like, why am I into that? Because I'm interested in this ecological idea and this idea of like. How these technologies are sort of a new weapons, or they're new um, actors in ecology, and then and I kind of thought, okay, it'll be like post-internet survival guide. So that makes sense because I combine what I'm interested in: this idea of ecologies and time cycles and histories and like struggle, um, and then I want to like survey this whole like new thing. Uh, so that, that's how I plugged into the whole situation and um, and then um, and it was back then it was many different things there was no style there was no post internet was not a style it was just like this this like process and this thought aggregation and this network of people uh, that not even everybody knew each other and then um, I just did the book and uh, whatever and they graduated and um, and then I kind of you know presented the book and I curated a show called Post Internet Survival Guide and uh, with like featuring other people so I was kind of curating, designing, making my own work a little bit uh, and at some point um, it just like as soon as there was actual like kind of art press on it 
then it was, it was basically in the end it was kind of partially projected. And then because some voices were a bit louder, it became a style. It became like an idea of a certain style or a certain like theme. And then um, and it was hard to, like, uh, once it was out there, it was hard to manage it at all. Really. So, so I kind of don't use it since I felt like it was out of our, my control personally. Um, because also it's just too limiting and then people, everybody has their own little idea of what it is. Um, but if, um, you know, it was had a very specific start and now it's just meaningless. So that's the funny, so I learned a lot and the kind of how that works. How you have some sort of something real and then it becomes like a shell <coughs> of itself. And of course we benefited a lot from it, but we also, like, um, the, the benefits are sort of how very, um, problematic and you have to like always like now if, if a journalist is like oh yeah I can you know post internet in a title like no <laughs> no don't do that and they still do it and then I just don't talk to them ever again but yes. <laughs> there was a time everybody was using this uh, this term in the last time well it's just so stupid by now it's just a meme again. so another question yes what about social media? Do you use it somehow, or do you communicate through social media, or does it? I'm not good at any, so I'm not. Really, I'm just using it as a normal person. I didn't go viral in any media, <laughs> so I'm just basic. <laughs> don't make. I don't make any advertising money from anything. <laughs> All right, maybe we're done. So. Yeah, maybe the last question, I guess the last question, you are using nature on one side and the technology on the other side. And I remember you said or right somewhere uh, that you believe that the technology, that the nature is still more advanced than the technology, that the technology is behind the nature. I do believe Well, it's, uh, of course there are different things a little bit, but, um, you know, whatever advanced algorithm you have for, you know, for example, seeing the world, like a little bird sees the world in a much better, much more faster, much more advanced way. That's basically what I mean. It's like, um, you know, a self-flying a self drone is the dumbest bird. It's like a bird with brain damage. <laughs> and that's basically what I mean. Yeah, although the bird is much smaller and much more elegant. And um, that will stay like this for a while. But there's other techno structures that are sort of having their own maybe um, uh, agency more and more, but they they would not look like a bird. They would be probably we don't even see them. Okay.